recording. Welcome to Math 119, 312, the Mathematics of Pandemics. Today we're going to be hearing about businesses and COVID individual versus states' right to choose. Take it away. Hi everyone. So today, Elijah, Obi, and myself will be presenting on the impact of masks on businesses. We are one half of the group Individuals versus States' Rights to choose, and the other group will be presenting on Monday. Here is an overview of our presentation and the topics we will, we will be discussing. Obligations of businesses during a pandemic to customers and employees, impact businesses have on the spread of the virus, importance of masks, social distancing, and capacity limits on businesses, how this has impacted how, how well businesses are doing, negative responses to businesses requiring masks, social distancing, and limiting capacity, and the right of businesses and government to, to require masks, social distancing, and limit capacity in business during a pandemic. Why are masks important in places of businesses during the pandemic? The greatest reason is that fact that if you have the virus, you can either have obvious symptoms or be asymptomatic. Wearing a mask reduces the risk of spreading the virus to another person, whether or not you know you have it. The virus can travel easily through droplets of saliva that can be released while speaking without a mask on. Someone who is asymptomatic can easily spread the virus without them even knowing it. And dependent, dependent on the business you enter or you're working at, you have a chance of spreading it to a large amount of people. Out of all the precautions you can take during this pandemic, wearing a mask is one of the simplest ones to do. Masks have become readily available with multiple sources showing you how to make your own at home. Finally, masks are one of the things businesses can implement to make both the customers and employees feel safer about coming into that place of business. On the next slide here, we see that wearing a mask isn't the only thing that a business could and should implement to slow the spread of the virus. Social distancing while wearing a mask is an effective combination which makes the effect of the mask increase while lowering the risk of transmitting or receiving the virus. In order to enforce these social distancing practices, businesses can limit the amount of people allowed in the store and put up easy to follow markers to keep people distance, similar to the ones found all over Williams. Another tactic would be adapting and applying curbside pickup options. This limits the amount of close proximity or face-to-face -face interactions within a place of business, which in turn lowers the rate of transmission. On the next slide here, we can see two pictures, one created by the Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and the other by the Catalyst Health Network. Both show in a very simple manner how if two people, one of them being infected with COVID-19, the risk of transmission decreases as both the infected and the uninfe uninfected wear a mask. And it is at its lowest when both are practicing social distancing while they wear their masks. Of course, this isn't perfect. There are other factors that can come into play, including how long or often you keep that certain distance, the type of wet mask you're wearing, etc. There are currently no existing federal laws that explicitly address mask wearing for public health purposes. However, a growing number of states and locales um, localities uh, have instituted jurisdiction-wide mandates requiring the use of face masks under specified circumstances. At the same time, mask wearing remains largely voluntary in many states. There are current CDC recommendations for masks and PDs and PPE. Um, the CDC recommends that people wear masks in public settings like on public, public and mass transportation at events and gatherings and anywhere they will be around other people. Masks are likely to reduce the spread of COVID-19 when they are widely used by people in public settings, obviously. Um, and masks should not be worn by children under the age of two or anyone who has trouble breathing, is unconscious, incapacitated, or otherwise unable to remove the mask without assistance. Um, masks with exhaustion valves or vents should not be worn to help prevent the person wearing the mask from spreading COVID-19 to others um, because of the airflow and particles that are released. Um, the CDC would tell you to recommend that people wear masks at first. I fear that there will be a shortage of masks for healthcare professionals, which was a major issue early in the earlier in the pandemic. Um, the CDC then realized with more information that there could be systematic and asymptomatic carriers, therefore everyone should wear masks when appropriate. Speaking is enough to expel virus carrying droplets, 
when this change was from late February to early April, um, as more information was evolving during the um, pandemic. Um, Masks mask should have two or more layers if possible to stop the spread. Do not wear masks that are intended for healthcare workers because those are usually custom fit to maximize their effectiveness. And it's best to say those type of masks for professionals on the front line. Um, and make sure your mask fits snugly against the side of your face with no gaps and that covers your mouth and nose. The use of face shields alone is not recommended, but you can double up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Cloth and surgical mask keeps the wearer from spreading potentially infected droplets into the air. The surgical mask does this a little bit more effectively because they have a double layer of thickly woven fibers compared to a single layer of traditional cloth mask. Um, next is the N95 mask, which is different from the other two masks and that it protects its user from the exposure during inhalation. Um, here, are, here are the costs of different types of masks from a reputable, a reputable vendor um, from the business perspective. There are many factors to consider. Whose duty is it to protect the consumer's health, um, the business or the government? Should the government require people to wear a specific type of mask if we know some are safer than others? Um, cloth masks may not provide protection from fluids or may not filter particles needed to protect against um, pathogens such as viruses. Uh, they are not for surgical use and are not considered personal protective equipment. Surgical masks are fluid resistant, disposable, and loose fitting devices that create a physical barrier between the mouth and nose of the wearer and the media environment. They are used for, they are used for in surgical settings and do not provide full protection from the inhalation of airborne pathogens such as viruses. Um, masks with air valves, air valves or have airflow risk, um, such as N95 masks, only protect the user from the inhalation and not the spread of the virus. Um, the valves on the mask are most often one way, so they don't protect people from, from people around the user, um, which is something to consider um, when trying to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, we can all agree that businesses and employees, employers should be actively working to slow down and prevent the spread of COVID. The question is who is responsible for whom, who should cover this cost, the employee, the business. As of now, across most of the country, people are responsible for their own safety at whatever cost they can afford. However, the, using the city of Fresno, California as an example, businesses were to apply for a disaster relief grant up to $5,000 from the Helping Underserved Businesses program. The government grant could be used for operating expenses of full-time businesses who have at least 10 full-time employees and had not declared bankruptcy in the last three years. The city also purchased 10,000 masks to be donated to small businesses. So this government assistance helps keep small businesses open and helps the individual businesses to make responsible choices regarding public safety. Um, lastly, as new area specific information comes in, the businesses need to make sure that their plans regarding masks are up to date. In the early months of the pandemic, when the science of the virus wasn't fully understood, masks were not very strongly recommended. That has obviously changed. Now, now we are aware of the mask they're wearing masks is an effective way to prevent the spread um, of the coronavirus. Also, masks were initially in short supply, and it made sense to assure that those at the highest risk of infection, such as medical caregivers or first responders, had an adequate supply of professional masks so that they can protect themselves as they care for patients. Um, a student at Medical University of Warsaw um, developed a mask calculator, which helps people see how long masks last for, how many masks you might need over time, and the projected cost. We, um, we will link the calculator so you guys can play around with it. Uh, here's an example of how many surgical masks an employee may need over the next five months, working an eight-hour day and replacing the mask every two hours as recommended. The price is pretty high for, you know, an average employee, which businesses need to factor in. Should businesses require a certain type of mask and force proper use of those masks? The main focus should be to keep the customers and employees safe. In order to do this, businesses should require masks that follow CDC guidelines and can provide images on the correct types before entrance. Also, employees should be provided quality masks to protect themselves while they work. Businesses that they choose can offer masks for customers who arrive without one or turn them away. And as data changes, businesses should update the responses, uh, their response plan to ensure safety of employees and customers. Masks, social distancing, and capacity limits support safe business operations. Although the pandemic has slowed down business sales overall, requiring masks and social distancing has allowed them to operate safely in person with new information. Even though businesses can operate more safely, businesses that do not have online platforms have struggled more because customers have increased online orders because of safety and stay-at-home orders. 
The more information that is released, the better businesses can adjust to operate in more in, in person safely, which will inevitably help businesses. We can see from this chart that the pandemic and the new store regulations have contributed to the increase in online orders, which has changed how people shop currently and in the future. Out of a survey of 12,000 consumers, 68% said COVID-19 has elevated their expectations of companies' digital capabilities. 61% said they expect more time online after the pandemic than before. And 60% said COVID-19 is changing their relationship with technology. Furthermore, businesses without online platforms may have to adjust to the shift in consumer behavior. We also wanted to navigate how businesses such as transportation networking companies such as Uber and Lyft have responded to the pandemic. We asked first how these companies been impacted by the pandemic financially. In San Francisco specifically, Uber's laid off 3,700 employees, nearly 25% of its workforce, and closed an office. Um, Lyft has also laid off 1,000 employees. Uh, Uber gross bookings were down 75% in, th in three months through June. Um, and Lyft declined to comment on the impact of the pandemic on its business in August. Um, as they cited the quarterly earnings report. The company previously um, said, though, that in April, the ridership was also down 75% from April 2019. Um, Uber, which is recent, which said in a recent uh, financial filing that it derived uh, nearly a quarter of its earned gross um, ride bookings last year from just five metropolitan areas, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, London, and San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and Uber's May update, as the, as the company noted weeks of steady growth after the initial pandemic restrictions, um, reopenings in Georgia and Texas were key sources of optimism. Um, those states saw 43% and 50% week on week growth respectively as their restrictions loosened, um, which shows that like as places open, uh, business gets better, but there's still caution from customers um, in terms of trying to stay away from COVID, um, which limits business. Um, now we ask, how these companies responded to the pandemic in terms of keeping employees and customers safe, uh, mandated social distancing procedures by not allowing uh, passengers in the front seat, which reduced typical ride capacities by 25%. Um, no more Uber pool and ride split, ser ride split services were available. Drivers and passengers must both wear masks. Uh, crack windows were rep recommended for better ventilation during rides. Uh, new and more frequent cleaning procedures are enforced for drivers and symptomatic checklists are provided for drivers to go through before they begin to work. When we use the term businesses, we are referring to restaurants, retail, office spaces, transportation businesses, and universities. We can consider Williams as a business who has enforced masks, social distancing, and capacity limits and recommendations. Williamstown has mandated masks in all businesses. Williams requires the students to wear masks and social distance in order to be on campus. It provides the professors custom masks in order to keep them safe and assist with their jobs. Williams has the community enforce the rules and keep people in check. These safety measures have helped Williams open and stay open during the pandemic. There's been negative feedback from customers after businesses require masks. Businesses who have implemented regulations such as mask wearing, social distancing capacity, and capacity limits have received negative feedback from customers specifically. The CDC released a plan to help businesses deal with violence after creating business policies on masks, social distancing and for customers and employees, and limiting capacity in the place of business. An interesting point is that the article from the CDC is representative of the different beliefs and moral obligations and freedoms that people think they should have during a pandemic. The threats the CDC identifies are verbal threats, physical assault, and verbal assault. The CDC suggests putting up signs, offering curbside pickup, advertising on social media, and assigning staff outside the store to help prevent these reactions. Now we will watch a short clip from the local North Carolina news station and that shows examples of these responses. As more businesses require customers to wear masks, videos like this from a Florida Publix you are in violation my constitutional right and my civil right are becoming more common. Hi everyone, I work for Costco and I'm asking this member to put on a mask because that is our company policy. So either wear the mask. And I'm not doing it because I woke up in a free country. Encounters with shoppers who think stores are robbing them of their rights. UNC law professor Rick Sue helps us unmask the rules. I certainly have a right to impose certain restrictions when I invite people over to my house, that's my private property, Businesses do as well. Mandating a mask, Sue says, similar to how bars and restaurants can require a dress code. 
if the businesses is trying to impose a particular restriction and you oppose it, you have no right to enter that establishment. That's their private property. In fact, it could be argued at that point that you're trespassing. Short of a business enforcing a mask policy in a discriminatory way, there's not much of a case. But what if the order comes from a public or elected official? What we're usually looking for is, is there a compelling governmental reason in order to protect some particular restriction or regulation? That's what the U.S. Supreme Court weighed in the case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905. A man fined for refusing a mandatory vaccination during a smallpox outbreak. He sued the state, claiming it deprived him of his 14th Amendment right to liberty. The court was actually very clear. They said that in understanding the liberty interest, we can't just think about liberty in the abstract. Every law restricts our freedom or liberty in some ways. A 7-2 to two decision in favor of Massachusetts. Justice John Marshall Harlan writing in part, an individual's liberty may at times, under the pressure of great dangers, be subjected to such restraint. A needle stuck into your arm in that particular case. And nonetheless, we've upheld it in these uh, cases because of the broader public health interest that has to protect. Whether it's a vaccine or a mask, the judges also said it's up to us to decide when something goes too far in the name of public safety. And then the court said, this is a policy dispute. Lots of gray areas, lots of disagreement. It's not for the court to settle those. It's for the government. It's through the elective process. It's through representation. It's through democracy that those things get settled. I'm Rob Wu, Spectrum News. While the video may have been short, it brought up some important points that we could discuss. The first was relating to telling people to wear a mask to enforce an address code. This is an interesting argument as a mask can be, sit can be considered another article of clothing you are told to wear in order to be considered decent. This does go against the standard idea of what needs to be worn, so I can see why this argument isn't as strong for some people. The video also mentions a court case from 1905, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, where Justice John Marshall Harlan says, liberty may at times under the pressure of great dangers be subjected to such restraint. In modern, in modern times, the courts have created a hierarchy of rights and tests to see if the laws passed can justifiably restrict these rights. The two rules that the court determined were whether or not the government could prove that the reasoning for, challenge them, for challenging the law had a compelling reason, and whether the scope of the laws was narrowly tailored to achieve whatever purpose it set out to do, and it did that by infringing with individual liberty as little as possible. The video also showed scenarios where employees were put in confrontational or uncomfortable situations due to the mask requirement. The next slide, oh, sorry. The next slide goes into depth about how, about reactions from store owners and employees to a state mandated mask requirement. The source that all of these responses are from is a reporter in Charlotte, in the Charlotte area, which is the same as the video. One of the businesses which provided people with food and other medical supplies did not want to enforce the mandated uh, mask requirement. They did offer people masks before they went into the store, but if people turned them down, they asked, how could you turn these people away when we offer such essential products to them? Another store owner offered other options besides coming into the store and wearing masks, such as curbside pickup and, on, and using their online website, which seemed to be effective. Another store refused to serve to anyone who wasn't wearing a mask, but they also, also offered to sell masks for $1.50 before you came into the store. And they said if people really couldn't afford it, they offered, to the, they offered it to them for free. A lot of the businesses questioned how they were supposed to enforce this mandate of making sure everyone wore a mask. They questioned if they should have employees walking around the store looking out for people who weren't going to wear a mask, and if, they took them that, and if they took down their mask, tell them to put it back on. And they wondered after a certain point, when do you ask the uh, customer who doesn't want to wear their mask to leave? They also questioned if they should get the police involved and how that would work out actually. One store owner felt better that the state mandated that everyone had to wear a mask because it was easier to have a rule that everyone had to follow. The reason that they brought up was if they were the only store that required people to wear a mask, then the person could either go to a different store or just refuse to buy from this store. So now that everyone has a mask, everyone is prepared for this rule to be implemented. And the last and most important point that the article brought up was most of the stores didn't know how implementing a mandated mask 
was going to affect their business profits, but they all cared about it, hopefully slowing the spread of the virus, which seemed to be have a, which seemed to be a greater concern than actually how much money they were going to make. Now we have follow up and discussion questions to our presentation and the video we just watched. During a public health crisis, do you think it is a violation of individual freedoms for businesses or the government to require masks? How do you think businesses should handle negative responses to customers who don't think they should wear masks in businesses? Do you think the CDC suggestions are enough? Do you think businesses should provide masks for employees and customers if they're mandated? How do you think businesses who do not have online platforms who do not have an online platform should best advertise and promote safety to encourage customers to shop? And have you received or seen negative feedback by customers or employees for wearing a mask in, in, in a business or in public? Feel free to respond in the chat or to unmute yourself and respond to any discussion question. Um, just to respond to Paul's question that he had early in the presentation, um, do we know how many Uber Lyft drivers have caught the virus? Um, no, I can find statistics on how many exactly, but Uber released a report in late May, early June that um, read that they gave uh, almost $20 million in total financial assistance. Um, 450,000 drivers were received PPEs um, and about 49,000 dr uh, drivers uh, received uh, financial assistance because if they find out that a driver or a customer um, was exposed to coronavirus or caught COVID themselves, uh, they have to suspend their account. And they started to receive a lot of heat and backlash, uh, especially in early May, I believe, when a 71-year-old woman died um, from coronavirus and she was a Uber driver. Uh, and that report was released by the LA Times. So I will uh, respond to some of these questions. Oh, wait, we just, uh, I, I already started responding, so we'll do David next. So in a lot of these discussion questions, uh, you talk about, is it a violation of individual freedoms for business or the government to require masks? Does it matter how the government requires the masks? Is it a vote of the legislature? Is it an executive decision by the governor? Is it an executive decision by the federal government? Does that change the feelings to these questions? Well, I was thinking about these questions on more of a state level, and it seemed like from the articles that I was reading, uh, the business owners who had it impl implemented on a state level appreciated that the state was looking out for them, and it they felt that it made it easier that their whole entire state was following these rules. So I think, uh, at least I personally, I think about it as a state level and I don't know how it would change if it was done on a more, on a higher level. Well, I, I agree completely that it is a lot easier if everybody is doing it. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's the same with you know, liquor laws in terms of um, what hours liquor stores operate. What happens is if you're in a state that doesn't sell at a certain time and there's a state that does, people will just cross the border. And this is an effect that's been known for years. I'm just wondering, a lot of it is on the legal justification. I know there's been some lawsuits in Michigan where it seems like the governor may have exceeded authority in imposing restrictions, which were done for good reasons, but were bypassing the legislature's role in this. And that for a lot of things, we have a check and balance situation. And I'm just wondering, if any of you have looked at, if anybody in the audience has any comments about the roles of the different groups. This is Marty Wasserman. I served as both a state and local health official in several jurisdictions. And frequently there's a board of health for either the locality or the state, which has the power to, um, to make and enforce executive decisions. So in a state or local area, you could rely and the governor could ask or work with the, uh, his or her um, state health official to come forward with that um, executive order. And in fact, in an email I just sent to the superintendent earlier today, I was explicitly stating that we should have the, a representative of the Board of Health 
explicitly involved in all of these conversations because as you say they do have not just the authority but they also have i believe the knowledge so uh, for the people who are presenting there are two questions that have popped up in the chat would you like to take them yeah uh to, to david's question we found in our research that the cdc's initial um, stance on masks greatly impacted how people viewed masks culturally and state by state um, and it uh, impacted the perspective afterwards so for people who took on the view that masks weren't effective um, it stuck and over over um, more periods of time when data was developed um, those people were less inclined to take a um, masks. So the CDC's initial um, response was very important um, in the, the view of masks culturally. And actually to respond to Evan's question, uh, some things that actually business order owners brought up is if the state mandated uh, a mask wearing and then they had their like police officers or whatever form they had it to enforce it and go into stores um, to make sure people were abiding by these rules, what um, uh, what like how what level of uh, apply or compliance did the state require? Like if they had one person who moved their uh, mask down under their nose, would the business themselves be fine because they didn't catch that person in time? So businesses were worried that uh, how how they would legally be challenged based off how they were uh, um, imply or applying the state regulated mandate. There was a, another question. I would like to hear the presenters formulate the argument against the statewide mandate of masks. It's important to understand the position you disagree with. So what might be the argument that somebody advances as to why it should be voluntary as to whether or not you wear masks? Oh, that was, uh, what was I, I was trying to answer. Okay. Yeah, I, saw, I saw where you were going with that, Obi, and just like to go, um, go on top of that. Um, one another argument can be against the statewide mandate would be you know um how is that being like how is would that plan be enforced or like supported for businesses or individuals is that say like providing businesses and individuals with masks and ppe or would individuals and businesses have to fund it themselves um which would be argument against like a, a statewide mandate in terms of funding um also you know we hear a lot about individuals rights to, uh, to their own bodies you know, and choosing not to wear a mask. And the CDC recommended that, you know, uh, early in the presentation as you saw people with certain disabilities or incapabilities um, should probably not wear a mask unless they have assistance of some kind. Um, so those can be some arguments uh, for, uh, against the statewide mandate of masks. Um, so yeah, I uh, think we have some more questions popping up. Different states have very different yeah, so to address David's question about um, states having different powers awarded, uh, afforded to various officials, um, it's an important uh, address because states do have different um, power levels and uh, assigned policy on masks differently. And so there were many arguments that there should have been a national policy on masks mandates, um, especially with Obi was relating to earlier on, where businesses feel like they don't have enough power to mandate masks and don't necessarily want that responsibility and are tired of that responsibility. And so a federal policy or a national policy on masks, um, a lot of business owners did feel like it would have helped them um, and would have helped the collective census, um, consensus to wear masks. Um, about Chris's question, what is a mandate worth about its enforceability? Um, it's a good point that if you really wanted to stop the spread, you would want 100% of people to be wearing a mask. But I think with a mandate, you get a larger number of people to wear a mask. So it's not about 100% or stopping of the virus, but it's about an increased percentage of decreasing the amount of transmissions that the virus has. Just building on that last question, Massachusetts is about to change its requirements starting, I think Monday, it might be earlier. Masks must be worn even when outside and not near other people. In-house uh, gatherings are limited to at most 10 people. And I guess one of my questions is, one of the 
thing that many people are wondering is, is this going to be enforced? I think that's up to the local jurisdictions as to what are they going to do in terms of enforcement. And is there a difference between requiring behavior like this or encouraging people? And how effective is it to just encourage people to do this? I'd like to make a comment on that. I'm a physician, uh, alumnus, and uh, I think that we have a history of this in the country. Everything that came out for public health safety, like seat belts and helmets for motorcyclists and all the smoking uh, impetus to get people to stop smoking. They've gone through this public awareness education and they've been accepted and the medical profession and the healthcare workers i think are the ones that feel so strongly that this is appropriate and that 1905 decision was extremely important and extremely worthwhile in order to allow our country and culture and uh, the rest of the world to deal with these problems. The healthcare workers see the, the, that disasters that happen. They're the ones taking care of these people that are dying left and right in the hospital. And you, you see interviews with these people and it's, it's just devastating to them to see something that they think is preventable and the public is not recognizing the problem in large part because they don't see the horrible consequences and they don't, haven't been educated enough to uh, go along with this. Obviously, you want voluntary uh, agreement to this, but you can do it. We've done it with all those other things. Everybody, no one was going to wear a seatbelt. It's my right. No one wants to wear a, a, a helmet. No one wants to stop smoking, but we've made a tremendous success. But you have to go. We have a way of, of teaching people and getting the right information. I think it's much more important to do it on a national level. We go from town to town, state to state. Something like this is only going to be effective through countrywide uh, mandates, countrywide uh, uh, solutions, and the most effective people who know the best what to do, like the CDC and other national organizations that are going to have more resources and more knowledge and be able to have more credibility. And I'm surprised that we didn't use our uh, way of educating people and convincing people with television, social uh, media, and everything we have available to convince people to do this. Again, we've done it. We've done it with smoking. We, again, you don't make everybody do it immediately, but you have to try as hard as you can to convince people to do what the evidence and data uh, supports doing as decided by the people like the CDC that we expect and know from past help what to do and is the best decisions for the country. But I think the, the, the healthcare workers seeing the problems, you don't have to see many people coming in with their head destroyed from a, not wearing a helmet, or many people can't breathe and dying right in front of you. It's just something that just eats at you and you have to try to convince people that doing these things is for the common good and themselves and as part of living in a society uh, like we have. Yeah, Donna, I think you make a great point. I, and some of the articles reference that the whole problem where if people not wearing a mask now was because of the lack of education in the beginning of the pandemic about like why masks were important. Even though they, it's all the information is out now, it's a little too late for some people to like have their beliefs changed. Never too late. Um, and just to address that, that point too, Donald, um, I actually like in terms of creating a culture around it and like using social media and uh, platforms to spread uh, like the, and 
encouragement of wearing masks. Like I've seen, I've seen so on social media platforms and com commercials and television. Um, so that like that met that methodology of trying to spread that culture and that um, and that encouragement to um, wear a mask even in places that's not mandated um, has been uh, prevalent in some places. But of course, that all depends on where you're at in your area. Um, and I think the push can be much larger than it has been thus far. Uh, um, and I wanted to talk about, I think, Gabby's question. Even if everyone follows the mask mandate, there will always be huge gatherings that seem not being dealt with. I mean, I think, you know, in a lot of places, there's mandates on the limit to how many people can gather in so-and-so setting. But um, I think as long as we don't have a federal um, mandate and of like you know how so how many people can gather in uh certain settings uh that, that will always be a problem um but we talked about earlier in the presentation about how you know even respected to businesses um, every situation is unique uh and that's the problem that businesses are dealing with themselves you know how do i make my business environment um as safe as possible for customers and, and, and employees uh, especially if we don't have delivery options or curbside pickup options, how many people are allowed in this venue and to order and to conduct business in here. So I think, you know, every situation is unique, but the, as we lack a federal mandate, um, that can still be problematic. Yeah, and also to follow up on that, um, that's why we added the slide of uh, limiting capacity and suggestions for social distancing because um, masks aren't just simply enough. Um, and that's why a lot of businesses adopted that practice and limiting capacity in their stores so they're able to socially distance, which uh, makes masks more effective. And uh, David, to your previous question about um, like, does the legal remedy of mask compliance matter and then all of that. Um, I think just making it a legal thing that people have to follow and that's mandated adds to another reason why people do it. Because if you had it up to a store on a case to case basis, then you have some people who don't believe in the information and they will, will just choose not to go to those stores and will just find ways to still live their life without wearing a mask and not complying with this. So if you make it a legal thing, then you have another reason why people should do this. And even if it doesn't get 100% compliance, you still increase the amount of people who wouldn't or who would. So just um, David's other question about the comparison to smoking and helmet toad, uh, he said those seem rather to be trying to get you to stop doing something risky or um, the effects risky like health yeah risk to your health um, uh, another comparison I would try to draw to is uh how we discuss in you know social media and um or around television other platforms been using um to promote the promote the use of masks um similarly to how we've been seeing a lot of platforms promote voting um for the current election and then we see how you know this is the most people who've ever voted in our history. So I think, you know, there's a similar push um, for people to enact something and do something that's for the greater good of the, of the country, of public health specifically for this. Um, and like we can see similar outcomes. Uh, can I also add to that? Um, the smoking and helmet uh, comparisons are different, but they matter because even if you're changing behavior for breathing, um, and it's not normal in the U.S. particular culturally to wear a mask during something like this, um, it still impacts more than just the individual. And in uh, pre previous presentations and speakers that we've had, we've had to understand that in a public health crisis and during a pandemic, it is hard to just make decisions for an individual. There's almost no such thing that you have to make these decisions um, concerning the impact on the general population. So a uh, quick comment. So I, I definitely see that point when you're talking about cigarette smoking and secondhand smoke. Could you explain the connection with not wearing a helmet affecting others? There's a significant cost to the society as far as providing their medical care. If they have brain injury and uh, they require their vegetable and require care for the rest of their life, it's not only a personal tragedy that's the most important, 
but the cost to society is significant. But then can you make that argument for any behavior that you do that has harmful effects to you that society will be paying for? To me, with the cigarette smoking, I can see the more direct impact to others. Well, I think you can make it to pretty much everything again. I think you have to try to decide what's the most appropriate thing based upon the knowledge that's there and try to educate everybody. But I, in my lifetime, I've seen so things change so much. Smoking, uh, it's gotten people finally are willing to make the difference and not, uh, you know, and go along with it. Uh, I saw a comment about uh, drunk driving. And I can tell you, when I was in college, um, you know, very high percent, we had, would go and get people drinking. I mean, we didn't have any women on campus and we'd go for road trips and we were very careless about it. Uh, we were just college students. But uh, when, you know, with time, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the whole thing has changed significantly that just about everybody buys into that and they treat it very seriously and there are significant repercussions. Things have changed, but I think all of these things are for the best for the individual and the, for the society and you have to push it. One of the biggest problems now is guns and it's a public health issue from a medical perspective and it needs to be tr treated that way. And uh, again, there's a right to you know, have a gun, but it doesn't have to be unlimited and it should be limited so that the society and the personal individual is kept as safe as possible and you have the best possible outcomes. Again, I think the medical profession feels very strongly about that. My brother-in-law is a surgeon. He'd see these people come in with these horrible assault weapon uh, things, uh, w wounds, and again, They'd either die right before you or be have their life, life all destroyed, which had effect on their family and the rest of society. I think it's extremely important and I think it has to be addressed and has to be, the education is the most important thing in getting people to realize what the, the impact of these things are and to try to get people to act in a cooperative fashion. We're in a cooperative society. We have to make these things work better and avoid these problems that uh, provide so much pain and suffering and financial loss. Um, to talk about David's most recent question about how do we think about what we force people to do, I think you have to look at um, what you're forcing them to do and make a compelling reason why this is like whether it is to protect their lives to protect the lives of others and then see how do you implement that in the least restricted way possible on their other liberties so if you have a compelling and justifiable reason for wanting to restrict some certain action um, if you can give that clearly and then find a way to implement that without restricting other liberties besides that then i think that's how you go about trying to find a way to force people to do something Yeah, I think in these types of situations, there definitely has to be um, on the state level, but even the federal level with something like this pandemic, um, there has to be, the government has to implement um, a strict scrutiny test, um, which they do when like discussing civil liberties and whatnot. Um, and there has to be a compelling like state interest or governmental interest um, to enact certain mandates and laws. And I think that has to be applied here. So yeah, there's no more questions. Any more questions? Comments, concerns, congratulations. I'll, I'll make a comment um, about uh, this particular case, or this particular incident. You have an infectious disease which doesn't recognize state borders. So ordinarily with something like tobacco or helmet wearing or drunk driving, you can handle those on a state by state basis and you have different cultural norms for the different areas. Once you get to an infectious disease that doesn't recognize uh, a state boundary, then you need, um, then you need, or you're best served with a broader 
um, uh, a mandate or broader uh, legal jurisdiction entrant. Uh, and that's why uh, the federal government, generally through the CDC, the FDA, possibly NIH, offering evidence then identifies what the problems are to the general public and how you must or how you can uh, within within limits and to the least extent possible uh, restrict individual liberties in order to protect the broader good. If the federal government, and we've seen it in this particular case because the executive branch not only uh, uh, wouldn't uh, work uh, to enforce or take on its responsibilities, but it acted contrary to what uh, good public health practice would suggest and what the evidence suggests, then you have to go down to the state and the state should take um, uh, its border to border responsibilities as seriously as, as it should. And that's why you had um, governors enforcing uh, mask mandates. You put a mandate in effect and um, you, you hope that you have a civil society that will basically follow those rules that won't drive when drinking, that won't go through red lights. Uh, there are, um, there are usual, usually uh, enforcement strategies, but you can't enforce every single effort at non-compliance. But what you hope when you put a law into effect is that you'll protect the vulnerable, you'll, you'll have most of the society agreeing with the law, you'll have most of them willing to uh, take certain efforts to uh, help others who might not be, compliance, be, be compliant with the law, uh, understand the law, and, and thus be compliant. And then uh, you have those cases where you have civil unrest or a lack of civil liberty, and then you have law enforcement to the extent that it will be engaged. Uh, just to use tobacco, because tobacco is a, we have almost a 60 year experience since the Surgeon General uh, had, had the first uh, a statement in 1964 and it's now 2020. Uh, you, you started with knowledge and with evidence and it, and it grew. You tried to make changes, you protected uh, children um, with, uh, with certain purchasing uh, rules. You also uh, use the taxation power of the state and federal government because you knew that uh, that taxation would decrease the purchasing of tobacco. You, uh, you then protected people from uh, the, the vulnerable population from secondhand smoke. And uh, you put enforcement in public gatherings in public places and then um, and then you put restriction on advertising. Uh, so there was a multi-pronged approach uh, to tobacco, trying to protect individual health, the largest one being, as, as has been suggested earlier, the cost to society and the Medicaid program, which is how uh, the, a number of Surgeon Generals got together, or state <laughs> officials got together and sued the, sued the big tobacco companies. Um, so you had, uh, just a number of the affected populations uh, being uh, uh, helped. And then finally, uh, those people who were at risk from a public health through no fault of their own, uh, you then be protected bar and restaurant workers. Usually that, that happened toward the end of the, uh, of the tobacco legal issues. And you can look toward this infectious disease, broad spread, uh, how do you um, protect the vulnerable? And, and the more dangerous the infectious disease, the, the more you, um, you need to invade individual liberties to protect the general public. I think another analogy where restrictions were placed in, in a more acute, immediate situation was World War II. There were a lot of things that uh, were implemented to try to you know make be able to uh do meet the war effort for uh all the things that were needed all the uh you know weapons and ships uh and everything there were restrictions on 
uh, diet and things. And um, I wasn't alive then, but my parents were and lived through it. And I never heard anything about people complaining or not going along. And again, it was a blitz of information and uh, persuasion and uh, even, you know, blatant propaganda, but everybody felt it was appropriate and worthwhile to get everybody to buy in and do it in a cooperative way and to make the war effort uh, successful. And obviously with this pandemic, you can't wait 50 years or it's worthless. So, uh, but you can do it, I think, like that in emergencies that need to be responded to immediately. I think this is a good place to stop. So thank you again for the presentation and we will continue this on Monday. Have a great weekend all.